there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we start a new study uh, on, on this program, we're going to look at the call to ministry. Okay. All right. Is that okay? That sounds good. Okay. <laughs> All right. We... Uh, we're going to start that, but before we do, or let me before I get going, Mark, why don't you just ask God's blessing on our time together? Oh Lord, this is a day. This is a day that you have made. It says, let us rejoice in it, and we rejoice in it. We are also thankful for it. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the friends that we have to sh to share it with. And Lord, just dig out what we need to hear today and so we can apply it to our lives for you for your glory amen amen all right i said this is gonna be about the call to ministry now um if you were with us we've been following the series we did we just finished last last program last week we finished the study that was looking at primarily at david in the valley of Allah when he confronts goliath that that whole encounter and i think we did that for I think four four weeks, and at the end of it, we were talking about the fact, or I was talking about the fact of what an impact one man, one life can have. Right? We're yes. talking about David, how his action, his faith, spurred on the entire army of God to go out and fight with the Philistines, and that's that's so important. I mean, we really we really looked at that and how so many times in the history of mankind in the word we see God using one person to impact the world mm -hmm. so I talked about about being that one you know are, are you called to be that one well this week what I want to talk about is the one but the everyone talk about everyone because everyone who is saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. everyone who is filled with the Spirit of God is called to ministry. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. I, I, I know that there's a considerable amount of misunderstanding throughout the body of Christ about the concept of ministry. So that's what I wanted to look at today. I just want to start by reading a verse <clears throat> that I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure you're probably all familiar with. From Ephesians 4, I'm going to read verses 11 and 12. And it says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So the purpose of this particular study may very simply be stated as the word going forth to equip the saints for their work of service, mm -hmm. which is otherwise known as ministry, right? Yes. And we're doing this study to encourage each and every believer to fulfill the ministry that the Lord has called him or, or her to for the glory of his name. Okay? So we're going to take this step by step. And I want to start with this. Because this is of first, important, first importance. Are you called to ministry? That's the most important question. Okay? It should be obvious to even the most casual observer, whether a saint or a sinner, that ministry in the church today, pretty much regardless of denomination, is commonly thought of as the realm reserved for the special, the spiritual elite. The leaders. Yeah, well, that attitude continues much as it has, much as it existed in the time of Jesus with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? And, the, and in the early church, right? Yes. However, this is a study of ministry in normal Christianity, mm -hmm. where every true believer is a royal priest, an ambassador for Christ, called to serve in order that God might manifest, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. That truth is made all the more evident by this God-breathed word 
again written by the Apostle Paul. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I read verses 4 and 7. And I also want to read verse 11 now. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So the key in these verses is, but to each one and distributing to each one. Mm -hmm. Every Christian has a ministry. You know, the Apostle Paul says here, without exception, the Holy Spirit calls and empowers each and every person who has been saved by the atoning work of Jesus Christ to work a service for the common good. That's what it says, for the common good, right? right? We have also come to commonly think of real ministry as being restricted to what is generally called the fivefold ministries. Now, that's that's a poor and erroneous understanding of ministry, mm -hmm. right? I read Ephesians 4 at the beginning. I want to read it one more time and think about this. I'm going to read a little further on. Ephesians 4, I'm going to read 11, 12, and 13. He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. For the work of service. There, that fivefold ministry does exist and plays an important part. But if that, min, if that ministry or those ministries are there to equip the saints for the work of service, it's equipping them for oh, their ministry. ministry mm -hmm. All right. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, Various types of tongues, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? That's, again, that's 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 30. So, yeah, these are the, there are those ministries. Not everybody has the same ministry. Not everybody has... It's one of the concerns that I have today with social media, that it seems because everybody has a Facebook account, everybody thinks they're a teacher. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. Very dangerous. You know, James says, let not, not, let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur, you incur a stricter judgment. Those ministers, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, are called to equip every saint for their work of service. Okay, that's being called to ministry. That's what ministry is. It's pure and simple to serve. Can you think of a better way of describing ministry? Yeah. It's a call by on, on your life by God to serve. And that's what Jesus came to do. That's what he that's, said. Absolutely. We're going to look at that. Think about Matthew 20, right? I'm reading verses 25 to 28. But he's talking about Jesus and his disciples. It says, Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. Jesus came. To fulfill his ministry. Yes. To serve. Right? I, I, we all know this, but I don't know that we see this clearly enough at times. On the night of the Last Supper, okay, that Passover meal, mm -hmm. Jesus did what was absolutely unthinkable yes. for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Glory to do. He performed a task that was usually allotted to a lowly servant. <clears throat> what did he do? Wash their feet. Wash their feet. Well, he not only preached the message, 
but he also fully lived the message. Mm -hmm. In John 13, starting verse 13, Jesus said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I mean, he said he did that as an example for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, in, it's, it's almost inconceivable. It was like it was a shock to Peter. Sure. That Jesus would do this. He even tried to stop him from doing it. But that's the call of any ministry is to serve. Because ultimately what you're doing, you are serving the will of the Father mm -hmm. and the purpose of the Father. So think of ministry as that call to serve, right? The call to ministry is a call to be a servant. It's about choosing to be a bond servant. Can I ask a question? Here? Of course you can. If the ministry is to is to serve. That's the ministry. Serve. But, yeah, go ahead. But the but the Lord through the Holy Spirit equips you with the gifts for that ministry. Yes. Okay. That's right. Yeah, but and, and he can he can he directly equips us. I mean, he's given us the Holy Spirit, right. right? Yes. But he also uses others. That's why he uses the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their job is to to provide. The material. What do they provide? They're providing the word. I mean, basically, that's it. Training in righteousness. Okay? They're giving you insight from, from God. Uh, they're directing you. That's the, that fivefold ministry. Part of the problem is clearly the fact that we, we seem to think today that ministry is encompassed within the walls of a church building. Mm -hmm. They didn't have church buildings when this was written. No, they did not. All right? I mean, you're getting equipped within that building. You're getting equipped and encouraged to go out into the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. What he was doing on the Sermon on the Mount was training and equipping those new believers to go into the world as the light of the world, as the salt of the earth, and bring the good news of Jesus Christ and everything that goes along with that, right? Mark was saying just as before we started, talking about, you know, the Great Commission in, in Matthew 28, where to go into all the world. All right? All right. Who's the we? Children. You. <laughs> no, you. All of us are. Yeah. That is, it's not are. the, it's Children not the. Uh, I'm going to sidetrack me again. Oh. Years ago, uh, I was, I was in Modesto, California, and I preached a sermon at this church. I was invited to, to preach at this church. And I went in and there was about 250 people there. And I got up and I didn't know what I was going to talk about, which is not uncommon. I mean, I trust that the Spirit would give me what to speak at that moment. And what I've talked about was the fact, and what I said to them was, uh, I said, this building is not the house of the Lord. This is not the house of the Lord. Okay, it's... And I said... I don't think this church is growing as it should because of a lack of good preaching. And then I said, I, I don't really expect to see revival. I, don't, I honestly don't expect to see revival in this place. Well, at that point, there were 250 people who had taken in a breath and didn't let it out. I mean, I mean it was. It, inhaled it was quiet. It, it was. But stop and think about that. We have become. We, we call these buildings the house of the Lord mm -hmm. when Scripture says clearly that it is not. God said, I will not dwell in a house built by the hands of man. And he says that in the Old Testament. He says it a couple of times in the New Testament. Where has he chosen to dwell? Ta-da! Inside of me. Mm -hmm. Inside of you. Inside of you. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not, not some brick and mortar thing. And if you, believe, if you don't believe that, you will act differently inside the walls of that building than you do outside in the world when you go out there, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact is, I said, you know, this church isn't growing because of a lack of good preaching. And I, then I stopped and I said, you know what? When I said that, you thought I was talking about your pastor. Not at all. 
It's not growing because you're not going out into the streets. You are sitting out there in the congregation. You're not going into the, into the highways and byways. You're not going into your workplace. You're not going into your store, the stores you frequent and sharing the love, the good news of Jesus Christ. Because we are all called to do that. We're all called to do That's that. That's what proclaim is, means to preach. Well, right? you know what? And go, go get out your little Greek concordance, and you will see that there's no difference between, in Greek, mm-hmm. in the New Testament, there's no difference between the word preach and proclaim. Right. And we're all called to proclaim it. That's right. You know, God called us. What Peter says, it says it so beautifully. We've all been called out of darkness into this marvelous, into his marvelous light to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus, of him him who called us out of darkness, right? If we were all out there sharing, if we were, because you're in that building to get equipped to go out, and every place in your life, you are to share the word of God and the love of God. And if we were all being faithful to do that, to fulfill the ministry that every one of us has, you'd see more growth in the church. But somehow... And I'm going to tell you, it is the work of the enemy that he has convinced us that ministry is constrained yeah. into the building. Unless, of course, on your business card, it says that you're an evangelist. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that is it says that God has God has appointed evangelists to equip the saints for the work of service. You, you can work that one out. Have a little conversation with Jesus, okay? What, do you, what qualifications do you need? Well, think about this. God called Moses to that burning bush when he was 80 years old. Mm-hmm. And Moses complained, or he, he balked and said, you know, I'm slow of speech. I, mean, I think that was done more in humility, though, because he was the humblest. Well, it was. Well, he was the humblest. God says that afterwards. I don't know. I don't know if it was the case at the time. I, okay. You know, it may have been after spending forty years tending sheep out in the wilderness. Yeah, I'm sure that humbled a man who had been living in the palaces yes. of Egypt. Yeah. yeah, but but the point is, it was like he was he was reluctant. Yeah. Maybe for what he thought of as good reasons. You know what? If God calls you, He'll equip you. Yeah. I mean, isn't that true? Wasn't it Jeremiah? Moses was old, and he's a Jeremiah, when God called him and he said, I formed you in your mother's womb, Jeremiah said, well, I don't know how to speak because I'm too young. Mm -hmm. Moses, well, he's kind of old and he stutters or slow of speech. That didn't slow God down. Jeremiah says he's a youth. He doesn't know how to speak. God said, I'm going to put my word in you. Right. What he calls you to, he will equip you for. We've, we've talked about this a lot. The simple fact is the, the real, the epitome of an evil leader is the Pharaoh of Egypt. In as much as when the Hebrews were there serving Egypt and they were being used to build, right? Mm-hmm. They, were, they had to make their own bricks in order to build. And Pharaoh would not give them what they required. They needed straw to manufacture the bricks. He said, well, you go out and make your own, get your own straw. In other words, he called them to a task and then did not equip them That's for the right. task. Right. Right. God will never do that. Mm-hmm. If he calls you to a task, he will equip you for the task. You can, you can be reluctant or you can be, you know, Jonah. How about Jonah? Mm-hmm. God called Jonah and said, I want you to go to Nineveh and speak. So Jonah, he just hopped on a boat and went the other direction. <laughs> How'd that work out for him? God got him there. <laughs> and then you have Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah is he's having this vision. He is in the temple. He sees the Lord with his train filling the temple high and lifted up. And and the Lord says, Who can I send? And there's Isaiah. Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're a little reluctant or you're just enthusiastic. If God calls you, there's only one correct response. Say yes, Lord. Yes. Obedience. And you know what? That's a great place to start any ministry, just saying, yes, yes Lord. Lord. Get in the habit of saying, yes, Lord, you'll have a powerful ministry, right? So, those people, like all the apostles that followed them, prove themselves to be servants of the Most High God. And that's the only qualification because he does the work through us. We just have to be willing to serve God, right? 
Peter, I love Peter. I mean, you know, he, he's a little bit impetuous, right? He's like a lot of us. But praise God that we should have that same faith as him. That's what he says in his second letter, right? It starts out the letter. It was written to those who have a like kind of faith, right? But he could do some what appear to be silly things, right? It was Jesus, well, when he was fulfilling his ministry and let the apostles know what that, what, what that was going to look like, that Peter was the first one to object, right? He made the biggest fuss about Jesus being willing to pay any price to serve the Father. It says in Matthew 16, starting in verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Peter couldn't conceive. I mean, you know, here's Jesus. We look, thinking, this is God, God's going to call you to this? Whatever God calls, the Father calls you to. Well, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm -hmm. And then later in John 13, Peter said to Jesus, never shall you wash my feet. We were talking about that a second ago, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Do the whole thing. Then it was Peter who was the first call to be an apostle. Yes. So, you know, Jesus saw something in Peter that was pretty good. So what was the ministry that Jesus called Peter to fulfill? He's being a fisher of men. Well, because he had grown up as a fisher of fish. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was God's preparation because God's hand was on his life from while he was yet in his mother's womb, which is true for all of us, right? But think about this, and I'm going to read this long passage from John 21, starting in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, <clears throat> you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grew old, when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. The first question, do you love me? Established the single most important factor in any ministry. One's personal relationship with the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Your, any ministry that you're called to is based on your love of the Lord. Every, the fact that he can call you is based on his love for you. Mm -hmm. We love him because he first loved us, right? What is the highest command, the foremost command? Well, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then to Joshua later on, right? This is what Joshua said when, when Moses had died, and now Joshua is leading him through the wilderness. He says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today 
whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's got to be, you've got to make a choice of who you're going to serve. And if you choose to serve the Lord, well, then you know what? He's in charge. It's up to him to determine what's going on in your life. This is not like, okay, now you get to choose what you want to do, how you want to do it, what, you know, what your salary is going to be, you know, the whole. It's not. And I, I've shared this here before. The one, somebody asked me one time, what's the most important thing that you've learned in all your years of ministry? And I, that's a good question. And I stopped and I thought about it. And I thought, and I thought, I thought, I said, you know, the most important thing that I've learned is that Jesus is Lord. And I'm not. Amen. That means he's in charge. So the foundation of all ministry, the foundation of any ministry is simply founded on your love of the Lord. Exactly. You can't do anything without love. No. We, well, we just read, you know, Jesus prepared, prepared a meal, a breakfast for the apostles as they returned for a night's work, a night fishing. They were out on the Sea of Tiberias, right? Mm -hmm. He ministered to them, giving them bread and fish. And this is what I, a, a verse similar to the one I read, right? So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. The apostle Paul's teaching on love to the church in Corinth makes it clearly evident that anything that is not done motivated by true love is vain. Right. I mean, you, you you can do all the nice things, but if it's not motivated by the love of God that's important to your heart, well... If, if you're not doing it for the purpose, for the love of God, you're doing it for the love of self. Well, you're doing it for something wrong. That's, that's what it's going to be, yes. Yes, because it's the good works that yeah. edify you. And that's where ministry goes wrong, right? right? But think about what Paul wrote to the Corinthians again. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 3. So, no love. It's not service. I want us to take note of the fact that Jesus first asked Peter about his love for him. That's what I said before, right? Peter. You've got to get that. Peter's ministry, but he said, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. Peter's ministry is to God's sheep. Right. At no time are they Peter's sheep. And at no time is it Peter's church. That's right. Jesus said, I will build my church. Okay? So I guess uh, we're running out of time. So be back. We're going to do this, sir. I go through it because it's really, really important that you understand your call to ministry. So be back with us again next week. And Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you can use us, that you choose to use us. And Lord, that you would use us for the glory of your name, that we might be a blessing to you and a blessing to others, Lord God, that we would truly be ambassadors for you, bringing the knowledge of your presence into every place. Well, God bless you until next week. Thank you.